Welcome, happy warriors, welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, do my solemn best to reveal how the world really works. Thanks for being part of the show. Thanks for all you do to help promote the show, because my solemn mission is to provide guidance and inspiration for happy warriors. And you already know what I mean by happy warrior, don't you? Right? Because every one of you, regardless of your age or condition, I see each and every one of you as a beautiful woman or a handsome and virile man. No gender spectrum, no confusion, just happy warrior men and happy warrior women. This is because this show focuses as much on your soul as on your bodies. And I know that every listener has a young and vibrant soul. What is more, we're all happy warriors because to live productively, we have to fight every day against the force of entropy, if nothing else. You fight to maintain your possessions. You fight to build and maintain your family and your money, your body, and your business, profession, or career. You see, God created a world in which chaos and disorder rules. Chaos and disorder are the natural default condition. And so life is a fight, and that is a very good thing. To stop fighting, to stop seeking, and to stop striving is to die. And I say you're not just warriors, but happy warriors, because you throw yourself into the fight for eight or nine or ten hours a day, six days a week. Well, that's pretty good, but to do all that with a debonair smile on your face and a jaunty pace to your stride, to do all that while generating an irrepressible surge of happiness welling up in your soul, well, that means you are spiritually grounded in everything that is life-affirming, devoted to your faith, your families, your finances, your friends, and your fitness, knowing that you can triumph over those who both intentionally and unknowingly promote a dark abyss of satanic secular socialism and all of the many destructive and evil social pathologies that it generates. Now, a couple of things that uh, you can do for me. Number one is to go ahead and subscribe to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show. That would be wonderful. So just go right ahead and hit that right now. And um, that way we are connected in that sense that uh, you will know each week when a new podcast posts. And um, secondly, you might want to think about becoming formally affiliated with the international community of happy warriors and you do that by going to we happy warrior.com we happy warriors.com that's all you have to do and you'll be able to join our community right there i i real i may not have said that as clearly it's we happy warriors plural.com we happy warriors Dot com, And uh, that way you can join the community. Now, you know, my dear happy warriors, that there is a huge disparity between intelligence and wisdom. Um, when I mock a professor, as I will do later in today's show, I don't doubt for a minute that he may well be more intelligent than I am. Very possibly, he may have a higher IQ than I do. Perfectly possible. But he's not wise, not even close to being wise. And if it comes to a choice, I'd much rather have wisdom than intelligence. Than intelligence. I mean, wisdom without intelligence, you can still live a good life intelligence without wisdom you are you end up being a smart fool and one of the ways of obtaining wisdom 
is by realizing that the Bible is not a history book, it's not a narrative, it's not a story book, it's not a fairy tale. It is a guide to a complex matrix of life. And two things in life that uh, are as true today and as relevant today as they were a thousand years ago, and they will always be relevant as long as they're people on the planet, and that is male-female relationships and money. Those two things are always going to be relevant. And in order to become a wise person, and the wisdom carries over when one is wise in the area of male-female relationships and money, then one is also wise in areas of child raising and building a business and working out transactions. And so it's always a good place to start. And that's the reason why the, uh, the, the, the reason why Susan and I prepared a resource for you on one of the most fascinating, well, they're all fascinating, but one of the most important to us books of the Bible, the book of Ruth, because the book of Ruth, we term the chorus of connection. And wouldn't you agree that the crux of the point of both marriage and finance is connection, right? You have to connect with somebody before you can live with them. And uh, you absolutely have to connect with somebody in order to do a transaction with them that makes both of you richer than you were before. And so the, the book of Ruth is marvelous in this respect, imparting so much in the way of sheer wisdom, understanding how the world really works. And so uh, we've got... Not only is this available to you, but it's available to you at a special discount, Happy Warriors. And w the sort of things we cover now, again, it's, you know, it's, it's a long, long study program, and, uh, and you're going to want to go through it with somebody who's important in your life, and you're going to want to go through it more than once. But to give you an, a, an idea, you see, at, what we've, we've got is a, a woman, Ruth, and she has a mother-in-law, and um, the mother-in-law's name is Naomi. And Naomi has a daughter-in-law, Ruth, and she has another daughter-in-law, Orpa. And uh, the they're all widowed. The three women are alone. And uh, she um, they, they start heading back from where they are in Moab and why I speak about why it's the fields of Moab, not the country of Moab. It's all, every word there matters in terms of gaining a deeper comprehension of really important things about life. So in verse 11, she says, go, my daughters, go, I tell you, why are you still going with me? Do I still have sons in my womb? Do I still have sons for you to marry? These are two young women who were married to her sons who died young, and now they're young widows. It's a weird thing, isn't it? These are two young widows who are affectionately clinging to their elder mother-in-law, and she seems focused on them wanting to marry another son of hers. And as she rightly says, there's no point in them waiting for her to have children because she isn't pregnant and she's getting old. And even if she had the hope of being with a man that very night, yeah, that's what she says to them, and got pregnant, the girls wouldn't want to wait around till that newborn grew up to be a man, even if it was a boy, not a girl. Wouldn't you agree that at this point, these two young women would look at each other meaningfully and, and they'd sort of point their fingers at their foreheads and say to one another, what's happened to the old girl? She must have gotten too much sun or the grief of losing her husband and her sons has gotten to her. Here we are. We don't have shoes. We're penniless. We don't know where we're sleeping tonight. We don't know what we're eating tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. And she's babbling on us about marrying her sons. Well, Naomi knew exactly what she's doing. But um, that's what I explain. And I explain that uh, it's very easy to dismiss parts of the Bible, you know, scornfully, say, saying, well, you know, that's just the patriarchy, or women were considered property, and so on and so forth. 
but uh, one misses the opportunity to gain deep and significant understanding of how the world really works, which is really just another definition of wisdom when you think about it, right? Um, then, I mean, to give you another example, a um, little further down the way, um, Orpa leaves and goes home to the house of her mother, not her father. Why? It's usually the house of the father. Why does it say to the house of the mother in the book of Ruth? That's weird. Well, guess what? You'll be amazed to hear that there's a very good reason for that. And then later on, uh, it seems if Nomi sets her eyes on a man who will be a good husband for her daughter-in-law, Ruth, and, um, and she tells her, um, you know, Ruth, excuse me, Naomi tells her daughter-in-law, um, go and down to where this man will be tonight. And, um, and I want you to, first of all, uh, bathe yourself, put on perfume, dress beautifully, and go to, uh, without letting yourself be known to anybody, go to where Boaz has just finished having dinner and um, note where he's sleeping and then come to him in the night and um, and you'll find that in the standard translation you'll find in many bibles it'll say and uncover his legs and lie down and from there onwards he will tell you everything you should do ruth's reaction should be excuse me mom i don't understand i'm not that sort of girl the, the, her mother-in-law, who's been so protective of her, wants her to go in late at night to the bed of a man she barely knows. Um, it's it's quite uh, it's quite amazing, and again, it's not just a story, but we're gaining an understanding into money and marriage. Something. Now, again, this isn't good general dating advice, but that's not meant as dating advice. It's meant as an understanding of how the world really works. And so Boaz ate and drank, was in a good mood. Ruth comes silently, and she uncovered his legs, and she lay down. Now, I have to mention that one of the things I do in this program is give you the accurate and correct translation, even though most English translations cover it up, mainly because it's awkward to have to um, explain something very complex. Uh, because what I'm about to tell you is so shockingly explicit that it would have required considerably more space to explain than translators have available. At any rate, uh, her mother-in-law said to her, go down and not uncover his legs, but uncover his jewels. And I think enough said on this topic for now. Uh, but for the rest of it, I'd love you to go ahead and get this and uh, make it part of your library. You can download it and, and get it instantly and immediately and uh, straight away start dramatically changing your misunderstandings of money and marriage and helping to make yourself and people around you um, much wiser than you are already and as a happy warrior you're probably already wise remember you'll find in the uh, description below you'll find more information but all you have to do is go to wehappywarriors.com and look for uh, the book of ruth chorus of connection use the discount code of ruth 15 ruth 15 and um, away you'll go you will find this to be an incredibly worthwhile endeavor. So uh, with that done, let's move right on. Now, uh, something happened this past weekend, okay? and this this particular podcast is um, releasing at the uh, beginning of the month of March, and uh, what happened this past weekend is that a 25-year-old U.S. Air Force enlisted man went ahead and set himself on fire in front of the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C., and he set his, set his camera up and he live-streamed. 
and uh, he made a statement. He said he could no longer abide being complicit in genocide, and the last comprehensible words he uttered before collapsing in the flames uh, were free Palestine. Okay, so uh, there have been a lot of comments about this uh, going around, and uh, I, I want to tell you how I view this. First of all, um, there is a professor of philosophy called Cornell West, um, who is a, a black guy. He's an academic, and he is the darling of the left, and um, for a lot of reasons. And he uh, he had his little statement on this. So listen to Cornell professor. Professor Cornell West speaking on this. Let us never forget the extraordinary courage and commitment of Brother Aaron Bushnell, who died for truth and justice. I pray for his precious loved ones. Let us rededicate ourselves to genuine solidarity with Palestinians undergoing genocidal attacks in real time. Um, I would imagine that uh, if... Aaron Bushnell, who uh, committed suicide, had done so in celebration of white supremacy. I would imagine that Professor Cornell West would not be nearly as impressed with Brother Aaron Bushnell's extraordinary courage and commitment. Um, I guess it, it depends very much on on the uh, on the cause. Well. What I want to clarify for you is that I don't care whether brother Aaron Bushnell died for the Palestinians or for the Israelis. I don't care if he would have taken his own life to protect the life of the unborn and to uh, protest abortion or whether he took his life in order to advocate for it does not matter not one little bit. And I think that's the really important thing to spend just a few moments understanding. Look, um, you know that uh, religion discourages suicide. You know that the um, uh, medically assisted suicide uh, regimen in Canada is opposed almost exclusively by religious organizations. The euthanasia movement in Europe and the growing euthanasia movement in the United States where doctors uh, help people take their own lives, um, that is, it's protested almost entirely by religious people. And in spite of the fact that there is an attempt to whitewash it by calling it death in death with dignity or the act to allow people to die with dignity um, it doesn't take very long of course for people to realize that there's really not a whole lot of dignity about it and uh, for doctors to be involved in that is a terrible thing and what is more what uh, becomes a rare choice or what starts off as a rare choice doesn't take very long before it uh, has turned into an expectation uh, that it's socially not only acceptable, but socially expected that uh, people who are at a certain stage uh, of age or, or illness are expected to sort of ease the burden on society by just moving themselves along a little bit. So uh, with religions protesting, and I think everybody knows that religions uh, discourage suicide, in Judaism and in the Bible, it's more than discouraged. It's pretty much the equivalent of murder. With the, I could, I could actually say murder and suicide. Yeah, pretty much the same thing. And uh, the the thing that I think might be interesting for you to know is that there is a general rule in the Torah or in the five books of Moses that um, you are part of society. You are one more person. And so whatever you are not allowed to do to anyone else in society, you are also not allowed to do to yourself. You follow. So you, you're not allowed to um, speak badly about other people. 
you're actually not allowed to speak badly of yourself. You're not supposed to lie to other people. You're not allowed to lie to yourself. You're not allowed to kill other people. You're not allowed to kill yourself. And that's how we know that suicide is prohibited, that God frowns on suicide. So uh, uh, it's it, it's important to understand then that, uh, to quote uh, Professor Cornell West, Brother Aaron Bushnell committed an immoral act. It's not relevant as to what the cause was. It's not relevant to why he did it. Um, did he grow up in weird circumstances? Has he has he fallen into the grip of left wing? It's all irrelevant. You don't praise somebody who took his own life. As a matter of fact, if it is a Jew who takes his own life, it becomes a very serious question mark as to whether he can be buried alongside his family in a Jewish cemetery. That's how evil it is. Taking someone else's life, taking your own life, same thing. It's a really, really bad thing to do. And uh, it has absolutely nothing to do with the cause in the same way that taking someone else's life in order to promote a cause, <laughs> it doesn't make it any different. Murder is evil. That's all there is to it. And uh, I, I believe just on a pragmatic level, uh, Americans like Professor Cornell West are doing a huge disservice to society. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Do you know how many people are murdered in America on an average day? About 50 human beings have their lives snuffed out by vicious thugs on any ordinary day in the United States of America. That's right. I mean, it's you think about it, that, that's a lot of people. And, uh, you know, here now, Aaron Bushnell on Sunday made it another one. But, uh, but here's the problem. The more you normalize this kind of thing, the more you begin legitimizing political violence. And, uh, and at that point, you've, you know, you, you've changed your society into a, a very primitive environment where it's now okay to inflict physical violence on people in order to promote a political position. <laughs> I mean, the, the end is near at that point. It's pretty serious. So the correct, the, in my view, the correct approach is, I, I wouldn't call it a tragedy. It was an immoral act. I would say that I am hauntingly sad for uh, Aaron Bushnell's family and for his friends. It's It's... It's the saddest thing. It's horrible. But what he did was thoroughly immoral, was completely wrong. And calling it anything else means taking one more horrific step closer to political violence in the United States of America. And so uh, for the very first time, old world conflicts have been introduced into America by the aggressive and radical Muslim world. You know, you think about it. I mean, Turks and Cypriots um, and uh, Irish Catholics and Protestants, you think of all the dozens of different ethnic conflicts around the world. Somehow or another, they never came to America. The Germans and the French, Right, Germans and French, I mean, I don't even remember how many wars they fought against one another. There's no love lost between the Germans and the French. And yet French came to America and Germans came to America. And that was it. The old world was left behind. And these battles were not fought on the streets of America. And for the very first time, resistance by any means necessary. That is a formula to legitimize political violence. And so uh, people are injured and sometimes they've been killed in uh, on American streets by, by Muslims or Muslim supporters and encouragers in the cause of an old world conflict that has been going on for a very, very long time. 
and um, Aaron Bushnell's death should not be called a sad tragedy. It's sad for his family and friends, but uh, what, what he did was an act of killing. And there's no difference between killing yourself and killing somebody else. The, the philosophical underpinnings of that is very simple, which is that you don't own your own body. God does. It's simple as that. And so what right do you have to terminate your life? You don't have your, a right to terminate your own or anybody else's. So um, that is, the, in my view, the correct take on Aaron Bushnell's situation. <clears throat> Um, let me move from that sad topic to a much happier topic of uh, of marriage. And uh, and before I do that, I have to tell you that uh, there was a magazine that uh, was really very dominant during the the first uh, sixty years of the twentieth century. It was called McCall's Magazine. It was one of the big women's magazines. Um, it reached a point where um, it was third. It was the third most popular magazine in the United States. You know what the first was? I'm talking now about um, 1950 to 1960. Reader's Digest was the most popular magazine in America. The second most popular was TV Guide. Isn't that interesting? And the third was McCall's, which was a woman's magazine. And... Um, brought to my attention, interestingly enough, um, was a, an issue of McCall's magazine from 1958. So uh, this issue of uh, McCall's magazine gets brought to my attention. And um, it's interesting, you know, bright cover with some pretty flowers in a vase and uh, a lovely little kitten playfully smelling the flowers and then there are a couple of articles uh, highlighted on the cover one of them is an article by a man called senator john f kennedy that's right later on to be president kennedy assassinated in 1963 but this is 1958 he's still a senator and uh, and he was so carefully groomed for the presidency he used to have people who like uh, Sorensen was one of them who used to write articles and books for him in his name and uh, here we have an article like that not written by Senator Kennedy but credited to him in the magazine three women of courage and uh, this has got a huge circulation in America and so right there and then two years before he wins the presidential campaign against Richard Nixon in 1960, um, just two years before that, he is listed as credited as the author of an article, Three Women of Courage, by Senator John F. Kennedy. This is so, I mean, from a political perspective, such invaluable um, promotional and uh, and and political capital being generated by an article like that, and then uh, um, new houses, what to look for in 1958, and um, are sex manuals a threat to happy marriages by Dr. David Mace? So there it is, you know, a very popular women's magazine, 1958, the height of its popularity came the early 60s and it declined and declined and it wasn't long before it was a goner and you, you can't, it's, it's no longer published today. But the article that interests me in this issue is 129 Ways to Get a Husband, a brainstorming report on how to get married. And sure enough, there are 129 suggestions and uh, they, they are all listed. Look, of course, some of them are funny. In today's climate, some of them seem downright weird. But you've got to understand there's something very interesting that's being revealed here. And I found this absolutely fascinating. And that is that a woman's magazine, this is not, you know, this is, this is not a, a teenager's magazine. This is a woman's magazine takes 
the job of getting married seriously. And so to just tell you the first, uh, the first few, get a dog and walk it. Have your car break down at strategic places. Number three, attend night school. Take courses men like. Join a hiking club. Look in the census reports for places with the most single men. Uh, read the obituaries to find eligible widowers. You see, women of all ages, women wanted to get married. And so the article was to some extent humorous, of course, but at the same time, it responded to a real sensitivity on the part of women. Um, sit on a park bench and feed the pigeons. Get a job in a medical, dental, or law school. Become a, here's number 12, become a nurse or an airline stewardess. Do you remember that word, stewardess? Become a nurse or an airline stewardess. They have very high marriage rates. Why? Because a kind woman with a smile on her face who takes care of you is irresistibly attractive. That's how it used to be. Now, today, there are no stewardesses. And those people who are tasked with caring for the passenger cabin on airplanes are more often snarling harridans than they are smiling stewardesses. But there it is. Back in 1958, that made a lot of sense. And even if you didn't necessarily take it seriously, it, it was thought-provoking. And number 18, tell your friends that you're interested in getting married. Don't keep it a secret. Okay, that's, that's very good advice to this very day for anyone wanting to get married. Um, um, uh, buy a full-length mirror and take a good look at yourself before you go out. Um, and they, they're divided into sections, you know, how to find him, how to land him, and so on and so forth. It's all, it, you know, it's somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but at the same time, you find yourself reading through it, and it's uh, it, it, there's something into it. Listen to this one, number 98. Turn wolves into husband material by assuming they have honor. Well, that, of course, is an anachronism today, isn't it? Um Resist the urge to make him over, dash, before marriage, that is. Remain innocent, but not ignorant. That's good advice to the present day. And um, so, it, so it goes. Now, the reason I mention this is because around about the same time, that uh no actually when was it no this was uh more you know this didn't come out in 19 in a current in a recent issue well a relatively recent issue a few years ago the magazine psychology today wrote a um an attack on the mccall's magazine issue of 1958 and it was written by a woman who's made a career out of not only being single all her life, she's in her 60s now, but promoting it as the best possible lifestyle. Um, and so she, she writes in Psychology Today, a hilarious and horrifying article from McCall's magazine, 129 Ways to Get a Husband. And um, she speaks about, uh, it's different today. Um, today, we've got lots of women who are, enjoy being single, who are not looking to be married, and an article like that would make no sense today whatsoever. And so she runs through the 129 and comments on each one. And again, just a, a couple of them to give you the gist. Um, Uh, join a hiking club. Do you remember that was number four? Join a hiking club if you like hiking in clubs. But hiking solo can be awesome. Really? In this day and age, you're telling women to go hiking alone? Really? Come on. Um, look in the census reports for places with the most single men. She adds, look for places that offer the life you love. Maybe you already found such a place. Congratulations. Stay there. Um, let's see. Here's another one. 
get a job in medical, dental, or law school. And again, the reasons for that are obvious. And now she says, become a doctor, dentist, or lawyer. You are a badass, so you don't need to marry one. How about the one, number 12, become a nurse or an airline stewardess. They have very high marriage rates. Here, this woman in psychology today comments, become a person who thinks for herself. They have very high rates of living the life that works for them rather than the life everyone tells them they should want. Um, tell your friends that you're interested in getting married. Don't keep it a secret. That was number 18, you remember? She says, tell your friends you have no interest whatsoever in getting married. Don't keep it a secret. Tell your mother. Tell all your other relatives. Tell all the random people you meet on the street. Declare it on social media. Uh, yeah, all right. Um, anything else here that... Uh, um, they have one, go back to your hometown for a visit. The wild kid next door may have become a very eligible bachelor while you were away. And Psychology Today adds, go back to your hometown for a visit. Chances are that annoying kid next door won't even be there anymore. Uh, number 26 in McCall's magazine was, don't room with a girl who is a sad sack and let her pull you down to her level. And Psychology Today says, don't room with anyone. It's so awesome having your own place. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, um, says McCall Magazine in 1958, wear high heels most of the time. Says Psychology Today now, Wear shoes with no heels. They are way more comfortable. Or don't wear any shoes at all. Um, number 54 in McCall's magazine in 1958. Tell him he's handsome. And, um, and Psychology Today says, talk to someone who is less needy and insecure. By the way, I've noticed that's a big thing among feminists today. Any time that uh, a man expresses a preference or an express or an or a, or a preference is expressed the answer is always he's needy and insecure and we don't need needy and insecure men look uh, there's certain realities about men and women and male and female relationships and uh, one of them is that uh, it is very easy uh, for a man to make a woman feel insecure. It's very easy for other women to make a woman feel insecure. But what is less well known, perhaps, is that um, the right woman, or the wrong woman, if you like, uh, has the capacity to make almost any man feel needy and insecure. Um, you know, men, men do have insecurities. Almost, even the most confident appearing man can be reduced by the wrong woman or the right woman, the woman who can do such a thing. So, um, uh, so again, the, the thing of, oh, stay away from insecure men. Uh, I've had to deal with this quite often because, uh, you know, from time to time I say that, um, uh, you know, young men consult me from time to time. Uh, sometimes I, I teach classes for young men and, um, and I say to them, look, if, if there are two women equally attractive and appealing, but one of them um, is a uh, an eager career woman making a lot of money, and the other one is a, uh, a nurse or an airline stewardess or a kindergarten teacher and who is who she says, I'm not that interested in a career. I want to be a wife and mother. There's no question. Go for that one. And then women re come to me afterwards and say, well, you said this. And I said, yeah, I did say that. And, well, uh, why why are you catering to insecure men? You know, call it what you like. But when we say that we're not being insecure, we're simply being realistic about the kind of woman we'd like to build a home together with. That's all. And so don't underestimate the appalling damage that feminism has done to women in the United States of America. 
Um, uh, uh, McCall's magazine said, double date with a gay, <laughs> listen to this, 1958, you could still use the word gay, double date with a gay happily married couple. They do not mean a gay couple. They mean a happily married couple, a cheerful happily married couple, so as to let your the guy you're dating, let him see what it's like. That's such good advice. That's really a good thing. And psychology today, today says, set him up with a married couple, then go home. I mean, there's a snarkiness to them, and it's it's not based at all on helping women who want to be married. Um, it's based on doing everything possible to sabotage women in that area and try to persuade them that um, somehow being single is desirable. Now, let me just uh, clarify. Let me tell you what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you can never, ever be happy as a single person. I would never say that. Happiness is a decision. That's all. And of course you can be happy as a single person. You, you can be happy in, in all kinds of situations. You can even be happy in horrible situations. But happiness is a decision. I'm not saying single people are bad. Heaven forbid, I'm certainly not saying. Maybe single people are often sad, but not bad. I'm also not saying that nobody wants to be single. Right? I think it's quite possible that there are many people who think they want to be single. I think there are many people who deciding to make the best of being single tell themselves that they want to be single and there may even be some who really want to be single that you know that's all fine but what i am saying is that the overwhelming majority of people now the mccall's magazine article was about women but um it's not you know this is true for men as well but but what i'm saying is that the majority of women would like to find the one. The majority of women would like to be mated for life, right? Hopefully with a great guy. Why do I say that? I mean, am I the majority of women? Do I speak to the majority of women? How do I know such a thing? Well, one of the things I don't depend on are studies, research, or experts. I try and do thought experiments. I try and do calculations. What do I mean by that? Well, I look at the plethora of dating apps, dating websites, matchmaking agencies. That tells me that there's a lot of people using those services because there wouldn't be that many of them otherwise, right? There's also a plethora of companies manufacturing cars, right? You probably can't even name every car manufacturer. I'm not sure I can. Yeah, maybe I could. But um, the market responds to reality. Let's recognize that. The market responds to reality. And so if there are a lot of companies making something, then it means there are a lot of people who want that. Uh, how many women's magazines and women's websites speak incessantly about matching, marrying, and mating. It's like an, the number one topic. And so I think it's a reasonable assumption that the majority of women would like to be married for life to a wonderful man. I also am aware of uh, the very large number of older single women who are distressed about having waited too long, perhaps. Waited too long for what? Well, marriage, obviously. And if, as psychology today would have it, that being single is awesome, then why worry and why be unhappy about having waited too long? I think also that it's important to remember that we are hardwired for permanence in intimate relationships. We are. Now, 
you might say, well, you know, it used to be that way. People used to marry young and stay married for life. That was much more common. But that's not because flexibility never occurred to those old timers. It's just that over the years, they saw that impermanence did not work so well. You see, here is one of the great casualties of secular liberalism. One of the great casualties of progressivism is that it contracts your time frame. And so if one is a religious person, then you are very aware of the past and of the future as well as of the present, right? Um, it's not an accident that the largest terrorist attack on American soil was in 2001 on September the 11th because when Muslim forces were defeated at the gates of Vienna in 1683, they were defeated by a Christian army on September the 11th. And as religious people, Muslims have a long memory. They think in terms of the past and the present and the future. Christians, same thing. Right? They, they are very much aware of the past. I have many Christian friends who think very much in terms of what would Jesus do and uh, and and Jesus is is alive to them, and um, and they're also aware of the future, of what they believe are God's plans for the future. Jews, Moses is as alive today as he was thirty three hundred years ago. And um, future, yeah, very much aware of the future. Now, the reason this is important. And yet one more reason for why it is that atheistic regimes have never yet created strong and viable economies. Um, the reason is because for success in business, you really do have to have an understanding of past, present, and future. As a matter of fact, I'd even go a little further and say that what it really is, is to understand that the present is really just a thinly sliced action that converts the future to the past. And thinking in those terms makes you a much better business professional because you can more readily understand trends if you are comfortable with an eye on the past and you're comfortable with an eye on the future, your ability to make good financial projections, your ability to decide what goods and services you are going to specialize in creating and providing in five years' time, all of those things depend on a comfortable familiarity with time, which is not something that is generated at all by secular woke progressivism. And so smashing of statues is a childish abolition of the past and comfort with abortion, more than comfort with abortion, making abortion the centerpiece litmus test of loyalty to the left. Yeah, destroying the future. Sure, it's irrelevant. It doesn't mean anything. But um, for traditionalists, for those who are in contact with how the world really works, well, we understand the need for past and future, an understanding of the past and the future. And uh, that is a little bit about the idea also of the permanence of intimate relationships. And that's really uh, what, what people want. It's it's partially hardwired that way, and it's partially that back up until the 60s, there was more comfort with past and future. So getting married was something that makes much more sense 
if you do have a sense of past and future. In other words, if you had any idea of what your relationship could one day be with a child, and beyond that, who knows, maybe even a grandchild, you would get married not tomorrow, but today you would run, not walk. But for most people, tomorrow isn't a reality. The future isn't real because people have suffered the casualty of secular progressivism and lost a comfortable familiarity with future and past. But uh, old timers were able to look at trends. They understood past. They understood future. And they saw that impermanent, short-term intimate relationships didn't work so well. They saw that attended, and this was known. I mean, you, you can read the stuff as I have, stuff going back to the 19th century, maybe even earlier. But I've seen 19th century writings where um, a decline in marriage and short-term and an increase in short-term uh, intimate relationships causes a population of justifiably resentful women. That's right. And heavens, don't we have that today in America? A growing and already very large, frighteningly large population of resentful, angry women. Justifiably in many cases, but that's very simple, you see. Because if you understand that the act of physical intimacy between a man and a woman creates a permanent relationship, whether you acknowledge it or not, whether you accept it or not, makes no difference. It's a reality. It's there. And so, very naturally, women may well believe that um, they are as comfortable as men are with short-term relationships. More often than not, women believe that if they uh, maintain the relationship with a guy, it will lead to marriage. And when it doesn't, and they've spent two, three, four, five, in some cases, one case I know, seven years dating or living with, a man only to have him move on usually to a younger woman a younger woman at that point of course she's angry of course she's resentful she may not express it she may not even acknowledge to herself she feels it but heavens it's perfectly natural and perfectly normal for her to be angry at men i get it and this has been going on in america since the 60s so we've now got two generations already of women who have been uh, badly treated, is the mildest way I can put it, badly treated by men. And the man says, hey, I was always honest. I, I always, I, I told her there was no future in this, that I'm, I'm not getting married. But it doesn't make any difference, you see, because so powerful is the physical experience that no words can begin to match it. And so the words that she hears him saying, I'm not interested in marriage. I'm not looking for marriage. I'm just, you know, I, I like spending time with you. Let's not spoil it by talking of marriage. She doesn't hear that because the exuberant feeling of ecstasy released by the experience of being together says to her, I love him and he loves me. And it's not going to be long before this is going to lead to marriage. And then it doesn't. And she is a like a bride abandoned on the morning after her wedding. It's not good for society to have a large population of angry and resentful women, is it? And again, you only have to look at American politics and who is who. And to look at the statistics, which fascinate me, on how many more women are influenced by woke progressive thinking than men. Many men are too, but the numbers don't even compare. It appeals strongly to women. And so you see 
the old timers were right. Promoting permanence in male female relationships helps to avoid a growing population of legitimately angry and resentful women. But that's not all, my friends, you happy warriors. Guess what else temporary physical relationships do? I've told you what it does to women, makes them angry and resentful. What about men? It demasculinizes men. What? Really? Surely all these men casually hooking up are just being very masculine. <clears throat> no, not at all. Here's the thing. I want to tell you a timeless truth. Listen to it carefully. It is demasculinizing, unhealthy, downright bad for men to be takers and not givers. It's a bad thing for men. You happy warriors that are <clears throat> raising boy children, you can almost not start too early in having them do things for you and do things for the family. Allowing a human male to be a giver much more than a taker turns him into a man. It masculinizes him. Men who connect with women and then move on are takers and not givers. At least the man who patronizes the... Um, the uh, the organization on the outskirts of Las Vegas in which he can dally with a professional lady, at least the man who patronizes that organization pays. He's a giver as well. Don't laugh. I could hardly be being more serious. But the man who takes from a woman and moves on, he's given her nothing, nothing at all. Now, um, some men with um, perhaps over-healthy egos will say, I gave as good as I got. And they'll say, look, she, she got as much joy from the, our interaction as I did. Don't praise yourself. It's not true. I'm not saying she didn't enjoy it. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that if what you're saying is true, then she would have been chasing you as much as you chased her. And that's simply not the case. Men go seeking women. Women, for the most part, do not go seeking men. And, uh, and it's a really important thing. Um, it's even in the language, it's an important thing to understand that in the sexual relationship, the man is more of a receiver and the woman is more of a giver. It's important, really important to understand that. And, um, and that's why it's, I mean, it's, it's even, even in language, we acknowledge that. She gave herself to him. She surrendered herself to him. It's always a giving on the part of the woman and a taking on the part of the man. It's, it's understood in, in language. It's understood in the emotions of the moment. Uh, it's a reality that is tough for most men to hear. But you're not most men. You are happy warriors. And so I beseech you to hear me very clearly on this and that is that uh, there is nothing that emasculates a man no I, I don't mean emasculate that's not quite the right word demasculinizes a man more than being a taker and not a giver and there are very few ways in which a man is more a taker than in the physical relationship with a woman. And so taking and receiving without giving demasculinizes men. And so uh, this is why in the uh, up till the 1950s or 60s, 
ordinary people, they they understood the appeal of shacking up and hooking up. They understood the appeal of that, but they knew it's not good for the durability and functionality and success of a society. They knew it doesn't work. And so they held society together fairly nicely until the 1960s. And at that point, lots of things began to... You know that. And so um, that gives us (coughs) a little bit of an idea of uh, what is going on in male-female relationships today and how you happy warriors can be thinking about this in a much more positive way for yourselves, for your friends, for people with whom you are connected. All of these things really, really valuable. So um, until next week, this is your rabbi saying goodbye to you from the Rabbi Daniel Lappenshofer this week. And I wish you a week of moving and progressing in your five F's, progressing in your family and your fitness, your faith, your finances, and your friendships. Until then, God bless.